So hello year 12 students um, studying the lieutenant. So this is our first lesson. We're going to start at the beginning um, and just as a way of introduction. Um, so it's by Kate Grenville and some say the lieutenant, others say the lieutenant. I don't personally mind. Both pronunciations are an acceptable part of Australian English. Um, in Britain, they tend to say lieutenant. In America, they tend to say lieutenant. In Australia, we are a bit of a hodgepodge of both. Um, but the author herself calls the novel The Lieutenant, which is why I'm going to try my very best to use that pronunciation, um, even though personally I tend to use lieutenant. So if I slip, forgive me. And the first thing I want you to notice is uh, this note on the screen here. Um, it is a coming of age story. The, the uh, protagonist, Daniel Rook, is. Uh, it starts when he is five years old and it ends in adulthood for him. So it's a story where he actually grows up and we follow him. So that is a coming of age story. Now, the literary term for this, which you can use in your essays, is actually called a Bildungs Roman. We write it like that. It's capitalized because it comes from German. And in German, they capitalize all nouns, not just proper nouns, I believe. Um, I don't speak German, but that's my understanding. But that's why it's capitalized. Um, and it is, uh, there is no space in this first one up here. I hyphenated up, but no, there's no hyphen, no space. It is one word. So you can refer to it in your essays as a Bildungsroman which just means a coming of age story um, and it's set in the late 18th century so the 1700s uh, begins in 1767 when um, Daniel Rook is five years old and um, so I'm just going to go through part one um, and point out a few things that may be of interest to you things that I think are important Take a look, feel free to pause the video at any point to have a look at any of the annotations that I've made and where I've highlighted. They're just things that stood out to me and that I thought were important. In any case, we're going to begin. So Daniel Rook, he is quiet and moody. Um, I've written an introvert and often excluded. He's described himself as an outsider. He had no memories other than of being an outsider. So he always felt like an outsider. Um, he was... He grew up in Portsmouth, 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 but we say Portsmouth. Um, they actually thought him stupid. And the reason, because his teacher, um, when he <clears throat> started school, his teacher tried to get him to pronounce C-A-T as cat. And he couldn't work out what she was trying to ask him to do because he thought, why would he ask me to do something so stupid and simple? Surely he's asking for, she's asking for something more than that because he'd already been reading for a year at that time. So he couldn't work out what she wanted. He sat at his desk, mouth open. And because of that, he was paddled with Mrs. Bartholomew's old hairbrush. Um, and what I noticed was that the reader can recognize his intelligence um, that the character um, has, but the teacher can't see. So that's an example of dramatic irony. And I also notice, and straight away, perhaps there's some difference with some verbal communication. Um, and we're going to continue on. Um, so he was paddled or whipped back for corporal punishment at the time which was quite normal uh, because he thought the question what he, she can't be asking me just to say cat um, and he could also couldn't be interested in his multiplication tables or the other students were repeating them and chanting them um, but instead at the same time he was collecting special numbers. So these are prime numbers, numbers that could not be divided by any number but themselves and one. Um, and I noticed here, this big section, like him, they were solitaries. So this is the first simile that's used to describe um, um, Rook's sense of isolation that he feels. And that's referred to a number of times, certainly something for you to note. Um, we notice that for a prep student or a primary school student to be even knowing what a prime number is 
divisible by itself in one, let alone collecting them. He must be extremely bright and gifted. Um, and again, the reader understands that and it doesn't take long for the um, teacher herself to notice that. Um, and she pounces on him one day and seizes the notebook. He gets really scared that she's <laughs> that um, he's, he's going to throw it in the fire. But she puts it away. And the next thing that happens is Dr. Adair from the Academy. Now, I believe that's the Naval Academy. That becomes significant later on. Um, that this academy, um, Dr. Adair shows up and we can infer that the teacher, Mrs. Bartholomew, has handed it over to Dr. Adair. We know he's an important guest because um, Rook, Daniel, is washed and combed for the visit um, and his sisters are sent next door. And um, Mr. Adair proceeds to ask him about the numbers that are divisible by one and themselves. Um, and Rook gets really excited and shows him his um, sheet that he's worked out, um, which is 10 by 10, the numbers from 1 to 100, and the ones that he's <clears throat> highlighted in red ink are the ones that are the prime numbers. Um, I noticed that Rook's differentness, his separateness, is foreshadowed from the beginning. Um, now he's searching also for a pattern. He's yearning for a pattern. He's trying to make sense of his existence, perhaps. Um, his father had a rictus of a smile. Now that's a quote that students often seem to use in descriptions of um, the reactions to um, Rook's oddness, um, but it means a frozen fake smile. Um, and mum was looking down at her lap, revealing her embarrassment at him. Um, and there's another description of Rook as an oddity when his neighbour says, well, he does look clever. Um, and he has a misery of being out of step with the world. So he's just an odd botch. Um, then he is offered a scholarship or a bursary to the Portsmouth Naval Academy. Um, and we're going to continue with the next page. Um, And so we're on page six at the moment. Um, he went along to the Naval Academy on him and he expected it to be the same as his ordinary life, but he actually found a big contrast. He was too shocked to even cry as he lay rigid in the dark because there's a difference between him, whose father was an ordinary clerk, um, who worked, and, and all of the other boys. Um, so the other boys tended to be um, uh, boys of um, good background. Um, and so there's a description here of him being bullied. Um, he is bullied um, first by a boy who takes everything out of his suitcase or his trunk um, and throws it all out the window into the muddy yard. Um, and then a teacher sees it happen and um, hits him with a cane, somehow blames Rook for all of this. And then another boy sits, um, makes him get up on a wall and beats him with a stick until he's forced to jump down. So pretty much some terrible bullying here. Um, he describes the um, pain in his heart, which was worse than the pain in his ankle when he falls off the wall. Um, and there is a, a symbolism of the physical space. So Church Street and the attic where he's home um, is the shape of his own odd self. And the academy sucks the spirit out of him. Um, so he stays at school or at the academy all week and comes home on Saturday evening for just a day on Sunday. Um, but it's really hard for him. It's described on the top of the next page. So we can make a note there, at the top of page seven, because um, he has to hide from his mum and dad. 
um, because they're so proud of him going off to the academy that he can't tell him how he's how he feels. And his little sister Annie, who was really close to, um, somehow Annie cries and wails, and she seems to know that he wants to stay home, um, and he she hates to say goodbye to him. Um, at the academy, no one else there seems to understand the prime numbers or um, all of his math stuff, the square root of two, nobody really interested by that or playing with pi. And he learns that if he has to be truly clever, he needs to hide all of his brains, basically. Um, he even finds them a kind of shame. Um, you can imagine him, even people today that would be a super genius might actually learn to hide it because they don't want to be different to others. Um, here as well, conversation was a problem he could not solve. So he can solve all the maths problems in the world, but conversation was really difficult to him. And I just noticed, I felt like this is possibly even some sort of like, Rook could have been even autism spectrum and undiagnosed at the time because they didn't really know what that was. But somebody who maybe was incredibly gifted in the area of maths and science and um but just the ability to make conversation never came naturally for him um couldn't make friends um but then he it also describes on the next page that so he either talked not very much or about something he was interested in he talked a lot like the distribution of the rainfall in Portsmouth. He kept his own records of rainfall. Um, and there's a description here about how much he hates the building of the academy. Um, so the physical space of the academy was symbolic of his emotions there. Um, and on a Sunday night, he um, would come back and he would notice if the curtains were open that a boy called Lancelot Percival James, the son of the Earl of Bedwick, um, was there or not. And he's the biggest bully. So um, he is... Okay. Lancelot Percival Jones. You can even tell by the name, right? Um, he is the son of an earl, he's got servants, he's got a butler, he's got a cook, he's got maids, footmen, um, and boasts about it by all accounts and doesn't have a lot of time for Rook, who's just the son of a clerk. Um, and I noticed here that the social inequality that Rook faces, he's the victim of this bullying because of his social status, it does help him, on my theory anyway, develop a sense of justice, which is, um, it serves him later in the story. In any case, um, Lancelot used to punch him, wait for him, spill ink on his shirt, and the other boys watched without expression, like it was normal, like killing a fly, that idea of the bystanders who didn't stand up. Anyway, Lancelot, Percival Jones, James, sorry, um, he made his money, he's so rich, because of the sugar trade. And remember back at that time, they made their money because of trading things, but because of the slaves that they had. Because they didn't have to pay for labor, they could make more money on their product that they're selling. Um, and so Lancelot Percival Jones was a bit of a stupid boy. Um, Slow-witted, I think, is the word that is used over on the other page. But... So he didn't know the square of the hypotenuse is equal to the sum of the square of the other two sides, but he could defend slavery and said that the British Empire would collapse if slavery were abolished. And he symbolises the racist views that existed at the time um, and helps us to challenge those views today. Um, but Rook, however, we were positioned to view Rook favourably as a modern audience because he is puzzled about that idea. So he doesn't understand why um, slavery would, um, or why the British Empire would collapse or why slavery was so important. <clears throat> so we're foreshadowing Rook's sensitivity, his compassion, and perhaps his involvement in um, um, slavery and indigenous rights later on. Um, and 
the top here of page 10, we see that Rook has um, his own space. Um, this is another um, analogy that's used because he's got a place where no one ever came and his emptiness, its emptiness matched his own. It was a companion of sorts, a desire to escape and again, <clears throat> emphasizing his solitude. And here he has a secret slot in the wall where he has a collection of pebbles. Perhaps these pebbles are symbolic. Maybe it's his desire, his only friends, somebody suggested. Others say that maybe his ability to appreciate the difference, despite they were all ordinary, is symbolic of Rook's ability to appreciate difference too, perhaps. And then it says a description at the bottom of page 10 of how Rook... Um, um, he finds friends in books, Euclid and Lily's Grammar of the Latin Tongue. These are both examples of allusion, which is when we refer to one text inside another. Um, and so the allusion that's used is uh, him having <coughs> books as his friends. Um, but here we also are introduced to Rook's fascination with language, Greek and Latin and French and German the genius that he is, were not so much ways of speaking as machines for thinking, which is a really fantastic view of language. Um, and he was um, interested in astronomy and navigation in particular. He learnt about scientists who um, discovered things about astronomy at the top here. Um, and there's a sense of his yearning for an orderly world where everyone had a place, even perhaps for a boy who seemed to have no place. So the yearning or the desire for a place to belong is there. And then we discover that, the chaplain discovers that, um, Rook has perfect pitch, which means that he can sing any note, just be told C, and he'll sing a perfect C. Um, and the end of page 11 describes how Rook loves music. Um, he finds a love for music. But even his talent at the perfect pitch wasn't something that was kind of cool for his classmates, something that made his classmates snicker. It's a good quote there. Um, but as he learned to play the organ... He says that a door opened in a world that seemed nothing but wall. So it's that sense that music gave him a freedom. I'm going to continue on. We're nearly at the end of this section. Um, so Rook loves the organ and he used to um, sit in the chapel playing for hours. Um, there is a great metaphor at the bottom of page 12 of him um, and how he loves a fugue and a fugue is described as it's a great metaphor um, he uses a linguistic metaphor and also a music metaphor combined with an astro astronomical metaphor so all of his interests music science astronomy and languages are all kind of um, melted together in this section a fugue is like it doesn't really have a melody it is um a piece where the um, sounds blend together. Um, he described it as a bit like a conversation. Um, and it kind of represents him in a way or his part in the greater world. Um, and then there's a section here that talks about God and um, Rook's relationship with God, that he doesn't really find God in the same way as the tr traditional church necessarily but in the night sky, in the stars, in the way that the stars move together and I guess the miracle of the universe itself. Um, so there's a beautiful metaphor there. Oops, let's find it again. Um, um, that's here and... Um, searching for a pattern and he says the pattern you might need 
not just a week, a year, but a, not a lifetime, but a million years or a thousand years, eons, then all of the things that seem unpredictable and erratic might actually make a pattern, like have a meaning, um, a kind of order. So the vicissitudes of earth, the ups and downs. Um, and so there's an analogy that makes that God is like mathematics. Um, and we see how highly Rook values mathematics, order and patterns. Um, and others are comforted by the idea of God, but he is comforted by mathematics and he is comforted by the knowledge that he is here, a part of a whole, um, one insignificant note within the great fugue of being. The interconnectedness gives him <clears throat> a sense of peace and hope. Um, and finally, the chapter ends with a sense of Rook's compassion that to injure any was to damage all. So anyone that's injured is actually hurting everybody. Um, and his desire for adventure, as well as the very last page here, he had no evidence but doggedly believed, persistently believed, that there would one day be a place somewhere in the world for the person he was. And we can say his yearning, his desire for belonging, for connection, for having a place. <clears throat> and there's a real sense of the place to belong being symbolic there. So that is the first 15 pages. Hope it's helpful to some of you. Um, make sure you take your notes and get ready for your essays.